have archaeologists uncovered a Hebrew text that predates any previous text by at least 200 years. That'd be amazing if the answer was yes. But the fact that we're responding means probably not. Our guest today, Dr. Scott Stripling, is a practicing archaeologist. He should have kept practicing. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Today we're taking a look at an interview by Dr. Sean McDowell of Dr. Scott Kipling that may have prematurely jumped the gun. He just published a peer-reviewed journal article in its defense, and this is one of his first interviews since. Mm. We're going to discuss his case, how it's been received by scholars. I'm not a scholar, but friend of the channel Dr. Kip Davis is. But not that kind of doctor. Dr. Kip is a biblical scholar who has held teaching and research positions at universities and museums in Canada and Europe. Take me and my viewers back to that moment where you first uncovered this tablet, and we will talk about what it is, where you must have thought, wait a minute, I could be onto something very significant. Okay, so Sean's guest, Dr. Scott Stripling, is an archaeologist working with the very conservative Associates for Biblical Research, or ABR, whose mission is to step into the gap, to contend for the truth, and to assist the church in this critical hour. ABR is a nonprofit ministry dedicated to demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible by using original archaeological fieldwork and research, along with studies of other apologetic disciplines. We take on the bold claims of skeptics and critics, we challenge the bizarre anti-biblical propaganda that is purveyed upon the public as gospel through television and print media. Yeah, so this is basically an antithesis of what my slogan would be if I had one. As a biblical scholar and an historian, I'm keenly interested in the Bible as an historical book, but also for how it intersects with the archaeology in what we now call Israel and Palestine. But from my perspective, this has nothing to do with demonstrating its historical reliability or contending for truth. The world behind the biblical texts is fascinating beyond most people's awareness, which is the main thrust of my new 18 lecture course, Real Israelite Religions, Facts on the Ground and Propaganda in the Bible, which explores the archaeological parlante in Israel and shows how the text developed out of ancient Canaanite cultures into the ideologically, religiously, socially motivated narratives, laws, and poems, and other literatures that survive in the Bible. And we'll get to all the details on that later in the video. Anyhow, about a year ago, ABR called a press conference hosted at the Lanier Theological Library, just outside of Houston, Texas, where they announced the discovery of a tiny lead object that they had identified as a defixi, or a ritual curse tablet. They found the item on Mount Abal and claimed it contains writing on the inside that dates back to the Late Bronze Age, around 1400 BCE. It is an astonishing claim. And as you can imagine, I and other biblical scholars have been eagerly awaiting the publication of this find since it was announced. Well, Stripling and two of his epigraphers, Gershon Galil and Peter Gert van der Veen, have now finally published this article. I led a team in December of 2019 to an expedition on Mount Ebal. And Mount Ebal is, of course, biblically the mountain of the curse. The blessings of the covenant were pronounced from Mount Gerizim. The curse is from Mount Ebal. Joshua 8.30 says that Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal. Adam Zertal in the 1980s excavated that site and left behind his dump piles, like all digs have. After they examine the material, they leave it behind. We have perfected, I wouldn't say we developed the technology of wet sifting, but we perfected it. Uh, and I became a big believer that we could recover up to 75% of the material that had been lost. In other words, the majority of the small finds have been thrown away in the past because they're dirt encrusted and you simply can't see them. So we were able to take the dump piles left behind, process them using this new technology of wet sifting, and in that process, we recovered many things. Stripling brags about developing proprietary technology for excavating archeological sites called wet sifting. For those unfamiliar, 
Archaeology functions by systematically and carefully removing soil from a site in an effort to preserve the layers built up over hundreds or thousands of years of occupation called strata. Older layers sit beneath younger layers, and well-trained archaeologists are able to assess social and environmental conditions and types of damage and destruction, and then assign dates to the layers on the basis of material culture that is buried there. Dating is determined from ceramics or pottery styles, coins, and seals or scarabs, but more recently, importantly, also from carbon dating any biological remains. When dirt is removed, it is quite often dry sifted in large wire mesh sieves, which then separates the small soil particles from larger objects. These often turn out to be manufactured items or material culture. Wet sifting is nothing particularly new. Like in the process of dry sifting, larger objects are separated from the soils in large wire mesh sieves, but also through a high pressure water rinse. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. One of them being a small folded lead tablet that we refer to in archeological parlance as a defixio or a cursed. This other archeologist, I think he said in the eighties was digging at Mount Ebal left behind just kind of sifted material he assumed had no significance. We also dry sifted it the same way that he did, but we went back to the dump and dry sifted everything. But then we took it through another process of wet sifting. So we missed it in dry sifting just like they did. It was only in the, the final process of wet sifting that we recovered. Mount Abal was excavated by University of Haifa archaeologist Adam Zertal between 1980 to 1989 as part of a larger survey of the so-called Manasseh Hill Country. In Joshua 8, the Israelites gathered to reaffirm their covenant with God. Joshua separated all the people into two groups, one on Mount Ebal and the other across the valley to the south on Mount Gerizim. The priests gathered in the valley between the two mountains, then shouted blessings at all the tribes assembled on Mount Gerizim on the south side, and then hurled curses at all the people on Mount Abal on the north side. So when Zertel excavated at Mount Abal, he unearthed a sizable stone structure on the north side that he interpreted as a huge cult platform or an altar. This structure measures 9.5 by 7 meters and would be far and away the largest known altar in the region. It's a fascinating one-of-a-kind monument. According to Zioni Zebet, quote, The structure is so unique in the repertoire of Syrian-Palestinian archaeological discoveries that many archaeologists have been reluctant to accept Zertel's interpretation, end quote. Zertel says that this huge altar was built over top of a smaller round altar that he asserted was the altar which Joshua erected on the mountain of curses, Mount Abal. Unfortunately, problematically, this structure is located on the north side, which is the opposite side of the mountain from Mount Gerazim. It is 1.7 kilometers away and 140 meters below the summit. So this interpretation seems strained and unlikely. Nevertheless, the site seems to have been a cultic structure of some kind that archaeologists largely agree was operative for about a 100-year period between 1250 to 1150 BCE, and it was large enough to have been a multi-tribal pilgrimage center before the erection of the shrine at Shiloh in the south, and this was a distinctly Israelite installation. So Stripling had the idea to do a wet sift through Zertal's debris piles. The problem is that Mount Abal is located in the West Bank and outside of the jurisdiction of the Israel Antiquities Authority, or the IAA. This is a highly politically sensitive situation. The Israeli Defense Force Civil Administration oversees all archaeological activity in what is called Zone C of the occupied West Bank. But the site is located in Zone B, which is under the authority of the Palestinian administration. These regulations have been in place since the Oslo Accords in 1993. The Palestinian administration has condemned Stripling's Mount Abal dump salvage, and the civil administration classified the project as a private activity. Stripling and his team worked closely with the nearby illegal Zionist settlement. 
Shavei Shomron, which is in Zone C. This is where they transported soil and material from Zertal's debris piles to the dry and wet sifting operation. And I suspect that this is what the civil administration classified as private activity. Moreover, in an interview about Stripling's fine from April 2022, our friend Jeremiah J. Johnston, whom you may remember from our most recent collaboration, our response to Jeremiah's seven best reasons for the resurrection, claimed that Stripling was operating under Zertal's license, which was pre Oslo Accord. Did he even have the right license? Well, yeah, he was there on Zertal's license. He can show you the license, and that was pre-Oslo Accord. Johnston claims to be a good friend of Stripling, but this is utter nonsense. Excavation permits are not transferable, and they are good for only one season. There is some debate about this, but many would consider Stripling's monoball dump salvage project to be a flagrant breach of international law. I think it is alarming that in this very interview, Stripling actually says of their operation. Well, nobody knew we were doing it for one thing. Um, uh, it was sort of hmm. sort of covert because it's in a very sensitive area. So even before getting into the artifact itself, the whole situation behind its discovery is a huge, sketchy mess. Well, I'm an archaeologist and, and a, a generalist. I have excavated at a number of sites in Israel and in Jordan. Currently, I am the lead archaeologist at ancient Shiloh, leading a consortium of 16 universities that are that are excavating there, Israel's first capital. And prior to this, we excavated for many years at Kerbet el Makader, which was a likely candidate for biblical eye of John 7 and 8, and also excavated in Jerusalem and in Jordan and, of course, at, at Mount Ebal. So pretty extensive field experience. Mm -hmm. I have a PhD in ancient Near Eastern archaeology. I'm also a seminary graduate, so I'm pretty comfortable with the biblical text. Stripling is the director of excavations for ABR. And he is also the provost of the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas. Katy is home of Calgary Stem Peter's quarterback legend, Bo Levi Mitchell. Stripling earned his PhD in archaeology and biblical history only three years ago from Veritas International University. Veritas International University was originally called Veritas Evangelical Seminary. It was founded by apologetics giant Norman Geisler in 2008. Picture a business card folded in half. That's okay. the size of this, this tablet, the Fixio. So it's very small, two by two centimeters once it's folded, four by two centimeters before it's folded. So the letters that are on there are, are very small. I think this is really important to stress. The artifact is tiny. It is eight square centimeters folded in half. And the marks, which have been interpreted as writing, appear on a two by two centimeter surface. It's much smaller than a business card. That's about the size of my thumbnail. The markings that have been construed as letters range drastically in size, but most are only one millimeter high. About the height of a grain of rice, if you can imagine writing that small. And the claim that these were carved into the inside surface using an iron stylus and can only be seen through tomographic scans. Yeah, this whole scenario just strains credulity. Now, obviously, I am presupposing that the biblical text gives us a reliable historical record. So I have an ancient text. And, I mean, Mount Ebal is not mentioned in any, any other source. All we have to go by is the Bible. The Bible says there was an altar there. Zertal discovered the altar. The comically large altar on the wrong side of the mountain, nearly two kilometers away. Miles. Kilometers. The Bible says they pronounce curses there, and we find a tablet that has curses written on it. The vanishingly tiny tablet containing microscopic letters written by a pen fashioned from iron before the Iron Age. This is awesome, but we've got no proof that it's from an earlier time period. You know, someone may have known or thought this was Joshua's altar in a much later period because I've never seen the, the folded lead tablet type from an earlier period. We do, however, have a biblical text, uh, Job 19.24, Job says, oh, that my words were written on a lead tablet with an iron pen. Hmm. And that and many scholars would take Job as the oldest book in the Bible. Some would dispute that, but many would. Um, no, no mention of the law of Moses. Many scholars is being generous. The vast majority of critical scholars agree that the book of Job was most likely written after the 6th century BCE, with the majority opinion setting it in the Persian period. Arguments for dating are based on the language of the text, the presence of numerous Aramaic words, historical and literary correspondences with other more readily datable Hebrew texts, and theological developments. 
Stripling is arguing from the absence of an awareness of the Torah that Job must be very early. The story is also set in the very distant past. This argument is based on the presumption that the Torah is the earliest text in the Hebrew Bible. But this feature he has observed within Job is actually quite problematic for this view. Since so many other features within the book of Job indicate it is most likely a text from closer to 500 BCE, then the lack of awareness it shows of the Torah could actually set this large body of literature much later than Stripling would hope. And this is precisely the direction that critical scholars are moving. The Torah appears more and more to have been composed very late. This is something else that I spend a good deal of time on carefully dissecting in my new course. As for the text in question, in Job 19.23-24, Job says, What then? Would that my words were written down, that on a rock they be inscribed, with an iron stylus and lead they might be hewn. Importantly, this is not a curse. Job is rather insisting that his case be permanently recorded for posterity and in an effort to enact justice. Incidentally, some scholars have suggested that this metaphor was inspired by the incredible, massive Behustun inscription that was commissioned by Darius I in the early 5th century BCE. More people should be talking about the Behistun inscription. The lead tests as coming from Lavrion, Greece, that the mine in Lavrion is in use in the late Bronze Age, and everyone agrees that exports from Greece to Israel stopped around 1200. So you're looking at a pre-1200 date. If it's from Lavrion and exports stopped around that time, then it's pre-1200, which makes it a couple hundred years older than the Kaya Fostercon. Mm, no. There are a few problems here. First of all, the Lorian mine was still producing metals well into the Iron Age and at least up to the 5th century BCE. This was a silver mine, led as a byproduct of the silver refining process that then became a usable export. The mines were operational all the way back into the fourth millennium, which is pretty amazing, but commercial mass production mostly occurred only much later in the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. In the abstract of this article, we read, During the Iron Age 2C, hordes in the Levant reflect a momentous change as they contain, for the first time since the late Bronze Age, mostly silver from Laria, mainland Greece, and Sifnos in the Aegean. So that's from 700 to 586 BCE. And according to this one, lead isotope and portable energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence spectrometry were applied to a small group of Hellenistic lead objects from Tel Iztaba, Beth Sheon, Israel. The sling bullets are of pure lead and its lead isotopic signature suggests that the lead was produced from the Lavrian ores. But then, Setting aside the observation that the Laurian mines appear to still be operating, long after the 13th century, Stripling seems to be sidestepping the important fact that in the ancient world, metals, along with most other things, were recycled. This is difficult to square within our own throwaway culture, but in a world of such scarcity, everything was reused. So even if the lead used to make this object could be isolated to a refining period in the 13th century. It can't. That wouldn't even mean anything because people were constantly repurposing metal that was already hundreds of years old. We have modern Hebrew, we have Paleo Hebrew, which is biblical Hebrew, and then we have the ancestor of that, which is proto alphabetic Hebrew. That's the script we're talking about. So okay. even if someone disagrees with our reading, which we'll get to in a little bit uh, of the of the inscription, you cannot disagree with the fact that it's proto-alphabetic, which means it's late Bronze Age, which means if we're right that it's Hebrew, then it's clearly the oldest script that we know of. <laughs> wow. That is a claim. So beyond all the huge, huge ethical and legal problems behind the discovery itself, there's the inscription. For some background, what people recognize as Hebrew is actually an adapted form of an Aramaic script that was used in the Archaemenide Empire as early as 500 BCE. We see all sorts of examples of this in Persian inscriptions from the period, but then also in the documentary papyri from Elephanti, 
These belong to a Jewish community living in southern Egypt between 495 to 399 BCE. This is not what the Hebrew of ancient Israel looked like. In fact, as far as we can tell, the old Hebrew script and language are almost entirely indistinguishable from their Canaanite neighbors in the 8th to 7th centuries BCE. It's why many scholars have gotten away from calling it Hebrew and more accurately describe it as Canaanite or even Phoenicia. We have examples from a number of important inscriptions found in the Cisjork, the Gezer calendar, the Mesha inscription, also called the Moabite stone, the Tel Dan inscription, the Kintilat Irud Ostraka, and the Katif Kinom silver amulets. Scholars have theorized that these alphabetic scripts developed from Egyptian hieroglyphs at some point prior to the 10th century. And wouldn't you know it? There are short Bronze Age inscriptions from Serebit el Khadim in the Sinai Peninsula, as well as Wadi el Holt, just north of Thebes, which appear to preserve these transitory sort of characters between hieroglyphs and an early alphabet. It is these early proto alphabets that Stripling and his team believes are carved into this tiny lead object. So, what is actually on it? Honestly, I can't see anything apart from what seem to be striations, cracks, and stress points in the metal. And I'm not alone in this. Robert Cargill has an extensive background in archaeology, and he has made three videos already about the litany of problems with the inscription. Christopher Rolston, who is probably the best living epigrapher in the world, has come out publicly and has also said that he cannot see any letters on the object. And the fact of the matter is that no one really within the field who works in the field of inscriptions outside of that team really thinks that there's uh, that there are 48 letters there. OK, well, essentially, we have 48 letters um, and the, the writing at this time is not standardized. That's okay. one of the ways that you know that it's proto alphabetic is because it's not standardized. It can go right to left, left to right, horizontally or vertically. Uh, and this is why there's always disagreement on what it says, because it depends on which way you, mm. you read it. The Wadi El Hol inscription was written in two directions, half of it from top to bottom and the other half from right to left. The point Stripling is making here is based on this observation, but as we will come to see, he has stretched it well beyond plausibility for this object. 48 letters and you have a repetition of the word Arur or curse. You have the name of the God of Israel, Yahweh, or Yahoo in this version, twice. Yahoo! So essentially, it's a chiasm or a literary parallelism that says, Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed are you by the God Yahweh. Hmm. Cursed by Yahweh, you will surely die. Cursed, cursed, cursed. So essentially, you're, okay. you're saying it and you're inverting it and saying it in a different kind of a way. When Stripling and ABR held their press conference to announce the finding last year, there were a lot of scholars who were immediately highly skeptical. I thought the claims being made were reaching, but I was also optimistic that this might actually be a curse tablet on Mount Abal and dating all the way back to the late Bronze Age. I mean, why not? I have a keen interest in the culture, rituals, and religions practiced by the people who lived in the Cisjordan. And one of the reasons for that is that these continue to reveal a much richer, more dynamic, and interesting picture of religion than what is claimed in the Bible. The archaeology of the region also helps more and more to show just how late some of the biblical texts are and the strongly politically and ideologically infused motivations the authors had in writing the texts. It's fascinating, and it's the primary rationale behind my new course. So when it came to this announcement, I was eager to see what they had, an actual curse tablet on the so-called Mountain of Curses, albeit on the wrong side, could still conceivably connect the stories told in Deuteronomy and Joshua to this site. The first mention of the name Yahweh reflects the migration theory that scholars have of the movement of this deity from the southern plains in Seir, but earlier than expected. First north to Shechem before Yahweh worship reached the tiny Jerusalem kingdom to the south. So if this was a legitimate discovery, it helps me a lot as a critical scholar to refine my own models for reading the Bible. Far from challenging the material that I cover in my new course, this find would have been highly useful in showing the dynamic and interesting phenomena and practice of religions and their history in ancient Israel, which actually appear far different from what the Bible would lead us to believe. 
Sadly, that is not what this is. In the press conference, Stripling showed a drawing of just the one word on the tablet, Yahoo. We had to wait to see the article before we could see the rest of the inscription. And I should probably say something about that as well. At the press conference, he said the article was nearly finished and would be submitted for peer review within weeks and was expected to be published in a few months. And that would have been late summer 2022. But that never happened. On the 11th of January, Stripling gave another interview. Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences, which is a highly rated journal, is where I submitted it nine weeks ago. And that it was expected to be published by the end of March 2023. He repeated this claim in an interview on the 28th of January. Two months ago, we submitted it to uh, Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences, and we are now in that waiting period in the peer review process. The article finally appeared in a completely different publication on Friday the 12th of May in a journal called Heritage Science. This is an open access journal that specializes in new technologies, immaterial culture. It's not specifically an archaeology journal, nor is it a journal of Semitic languages and ancient history. This was a red flag from the start. It looks like the author submitted this article multiple times for publication with no success before finally getting out in a journal with only a tangential relationship to the most relevant fields. So once the journal was out, I was keen to finally see what they had. Wow, what a letdown. Ordinarily for an article of this magnitude, one would expect to see high resolution images of the tablet and the inscription and a clear and detailed paleograph showing all of the letters in an alphabetic arrangement for comparison. That is not what was published. Here is a drawing made by one of the epigraphers, Gershon Galil, of the inscription on the object. Here is his paleographical table, which is just a reproduction of his drawings of the letters, not the actual letters themselves. And problematically, no two letters look alike, and they are all different sizes and orientations. The authors included these separate images of each letter for comparison. But on all of them, I can't make out what they see in the images for what they reproduce as actual letters. So when I transpose Galil's drawing of the inscription on the image they included of the tablet, this is what it looks like. It's a jumble of marks construed from mostly indecipherable lines. But what is even worse is how they have chosen to read these marks. Here is the word-by-word -word reproduction of their reading that I have color-coded yellow, green, and blue to show what Stripling has called a chiastic arrangement of the text. You are cursed by the god, Yaho, curse. You will die, cursed, cursed. You will surely die, cursed. You are by Yaho curse. Did you follow that? So we're supposed to read this text from bottom left corner up, then right, then left, then right again across the top, then down to the right, then left, and then right to the center. <laughs> yup. What's even worse is the path the text supposedly takes from one letter to the next. This is nonsense. Everyone should be able to see that. Not only are most of the supposed letters not even there, but the way Stripling and his team want us to read this is simply untenable. It's ridiculous, which is why it is being widely panned by every archaeologist, epigrapher, and biblical scholar who has seen it. And anyone who was being critical at that time had not yet seen the scans. The academic article mm. was now published, and so and published in a very okay. highly rated, highly respectable academic journal. But importantly, not an archaeology journal, nor one specializing in Northwest Semitics. Uh, so everybody can look at the scans for themselves, and if, if they agree that that is a yod, that is a he, that is a vav, if that's not Yahoo, then I don't know what is. Yes, the article is out. We have seen the scans and the reaction has been devastating. No one is convinced by any of this. This notion that if the divine name Yahweh or shortened form of it is present in these texts, this must be a Hebrew inscription. That's absurd as well, right? It doesn't follow. The divine name Yahweh, yod -Heh vav -Heh, right? Y-H-W-H. Mm -hmm. 
that's the basic word for to be or I am, right? We know this from Exodus 3. Mm -hmm. So that word I am or he is, it's pervasive in the Bible is a verb. So even if those letters are present on this tablet, it could very well just be the verb and not the divine name. So there are all sorts of assumptions uh, that are present with Stripling and Galil and Vanderveen. And I wish that they had been circumspect and cautious hmm. because I think, I think facts are really nice. Um, I think it has an important apologetic aspect because the, the criticism of the biblical text that it's not reliable, that it wasn't written until a thousand years after it purports to have been written, that Moses and Joshua were illiterate. They could not have, have written it, even though Jesus said that Moses did. That is a problem. Actually, that's a big problem, Guy. It's a massive problem. And if we do indeed have evidence at a place where God told him to write of writing and the script is from that time period, then I think there's a high degree of likelihood that you are looking at, at evidence that Moses and Joshua were indeed literate and capable of writing uh, the Pentateuch as, and the, the Hexateuch as far as that goes. All right. Even if this is a legitimate inscription, which I think it is not, as I have clearly shown, but even if it is, stringing together eight letters 40 times in a random jumble of five repeating words is not the same as writing the Pentateuch. There was an astonishing moment during the press conference last year in which Galil claimed that it is clear that the, the person who wrote it was was a genius. So he was not not only a scribe; he was a theologian. He was he was a, he was a, a leader. What? How can we know that? Unbelievable! Literacy is not a zero sum game. There is a vast spectrum from complete illiteracy on one end to the compositional fluency required for writing literature like the Pentateuch on the other. All this find would show is that people recognized enough letters and words to write them on a simple ritual object. An object, importantly, that was never intended to be read in the first place. Even if this is a Bronze Age defixio as claimed, it gets us nowhere close to the kind of literacy that would be required for writing a masterpiece like the Pentateuch. Hmm. But Galil said, whoever wrote this text that, you know, these 48 letters that he thought he saw was brilliant and could have written the entire Bible. Hmm. That's a fascinating claim. On the basis of four words, when the Bible has more than 8,500 words, does it do anyone any good to make a statement like that? And does anybody think that that's a credible claim? You also mentioned earlier that when you uh, talked about it referring to Yahweh. Some people were not able to see the inscription early on. And I did a show on this before, and some people were like, wait a minute, we want to see this. Now it's out, and so people can see it, and scholars seem to agree enough with you that you make a solid case that this should be taken seriously as Yahweh. They do not. There are very few scholars who are going to argue that this is not a proto-alphabetic script that dates to the late Bronze Age. Oh, but they do. They're arguing that you are seeing only what you want to see. Chris Rolston called this a Rorschach test. Most people in my field look at the photos, they look at the drawings, they see the claims, and they say, this is so ridiculous, I'm not going to dignify it by writing about it. Wow. I was the lead author, and then we had Peter Vanderveen and Ger uh, Gershon Galil, who were my epigraphers, one from Germany, one from Israel. And then I had the three scientists from Prague. Um, so my team was collaborative in, in and of itself. And we consulted with a lot of other experts mm. uh, along the way too. Listen, I was in no hurry to stick my neck out and, you know, sure. lose my reputation on this. You know, I think there is a very real danger for Stripling and Galil of this happening. Since the publication of the article, the other author, Peter Gert van der Veen, has been more and more widely distancing himself from these readings. Now, part of the team is saying, no, actually, right, this is important too. Part of the team is now saying, no, we don't see the 48 letters. Just one member of the team saw 48 letters, which mm. is pretty telling as well. The team itself is not unified in the number of letters that are present there. Mm. That's pretty striking, and I think it's pretty telling. Furthermore, I've heard from people in the know that there could be very serious, broader implications because of the way the excavation and transport of the object were undertaken. This looks very bad for Stripling and his team, and it is likely not over. You have to understand, we studied this 
hours every day for the last 15 mm. months. So you're talking hours a day, every day, looking at scans, analyzing. So I have that advantage. Whereas when a scholar or anybody else looks at this for the first mm. time, maybe their eyes are gonna, not going to as easily see what we can see through extensive study. Yeah, I've heard both of these claims by Stripling and his colleague Vanderveen a few times now. The idea that the readings were produced from hours and hours of extended study of the object sounds good, but might actually be highly problematic. Simply put, anything that you can't quite see readily to distinguish as man-made intentional markings should make you suspicious. Often, after you have spent a lot of time staring at the same item, your brain will start to build patterns out of everything that you are seeing, even in instances where there is nothing there. It's called pareidolia, the tendency to perceive a specific, often meaningful, image in a random, more ambiguous visual pattern. This does not bolster my confidence in the reading and rather helps to make some psychological sense of this Rorschach test. But look on the outside of the tablet and we have bulges that, that reinforce that. As for the bulges on the exterior surface, these don't appear meaningful to me, especially given that there are no discernible letters to be seen on the inside. Well, Julius Wilhausen laid out his documentary hypothesis and followers of his then had different variations off of that. But essentially the idea is that the text is comprised in stages and it's not redacted into its final form until say the Persian or Hellenistic period. In other words, we're not to believe that Moses actually wrote the Pentateuch or that Joshua actually contributed to that and then wrote other books as well. But we have histories that are gradually being compiled, redacted, and then given to us in a final form in the late in the second double period. This disproves that, um, I believe, because it shows that the Jehovah source, the J source, and the Elohim source are in existence at the same time, not hundreds of years apart. Of all the ridiculously hyperbolic assertions that Stripling makes, this is one of the most astonishing because it shows with abundant clarity that this archaeologist, this supposed PhD trained expert in biblical studies, cannot even correctly articulate the basic premises of the documentary hypothesis or other so-called source theories. This is undoubtedly for another video, but in short, the presence of the highly generic identifying word L which means very basically God, next to the divine name Yahweh or Yeho, does absolutely nothing at all to detract from the strength of the source theories. It's moronic. How else does Stripling imagine that source critics think that the sources referred to God without the word God? What would that even look like? Walk us through a little bit this peer-reviewed process. A, a peer-reviewed journal is blind, so... If I'm the author, I don't know who the peer reviewers are. An article is submitted to, the, to an editor. That editor then invites peer reviewers. And he or she is looking for reviewers who have expertise in that area. Now, ours was problematic because you had to have expertise in computer science. You had to have expertise in, in epigraphy and in archaeology. So um, it took a while. Um, you know, I was hoping this would be out during the summer, but it took a while for them mm. to find qualified people. So we don't know who those people are. To this day, I don't know who these peer reviewers oh, were. Oh, wow. Which is normal. In blind review situations, the reviewers and the authors are supposed to remain unknown to one another. Of course, there are plenty of instances in which this discovery can happen accidentally. I once accidentally discovered the identity of the author of an article I was peer reviewing, but that is not part of the procedure in these situations. I think the problem here is that the article itself was written for two quite different audiences, but published in a journal specializing in only one of them on the scientific imaging side. As I have suggested on Twitter, a much better approach for Stripling and his team would have been to turn this already huge article into two, one about the scientific process of conservation, scanning and imaging the object which seems appropriate for the journal Heritage Science, where it was actually published. But then, the second part of the article about the discovery, provenance, epigraphy, and interpretation of the object should have been published separately in a journal that actually specializes in ancient Near Eastern studies, archaeology of the Levant, or biblical scholarship. I rather think that the decision made to publish this article in this journal was made in an effort to sidestep review from more archaeologically and epigraphically competent peers 
who undoubtedly would have tossed it as nonsense. The second reviewer was under the impression that I was the Antichrist for some reason. <laughs> and uh, did, did not at all think that this was good and uh, thought that, I, that it was illegal and I had forged it and everything you can imagine. Wow. As I mentioned earlier, this is really problematic. The critical reviewer Stripling mentioned was right to question the legality of this discovery. Most reputable publishers have policies against publishing non-provenance artifacts, which is precisely what this is. It was taken out of a debris pile without an excavation permit and cannot be traced with any accuracy at all back to its find spot. Sounds more like looting than archaeology. Exactly. In another interview a couple weeks back, Strickling himself acknowledges the sensitive legalities, and then he says that his editor at Heritage Science was under pressure not to publish it precisely because of its controversial provenance. And we don't know what this documentation is. The Palestinian Authority has condemned the whole operation and clearly did not sanction Stripling's dump salvage on Matabal in Area B. The Israeli Civil Administration called it a private activity, but this most likely of the sifting operation which occurred at the Shavay Shomron settlement in Zone C. But Jeremiah J. Johnson claims that Stippling was operating under Zertl's excavation license from over 35 years ago. Right, and that's farcical. Exactly what is wrong with a lot of so-called biblical archaeology? It seems clear to me that Stripling, a fundamentalist evangelical Christian, and the ABR, a fundamentalist evangelical Christian organization, have no actual interest in learning or expanding our knowledge about the history and cultures of the Cisjordan and Transjordan regions, what we call Israel and Palestine. They regularly skirt legal and ethical archaeological protocols, and they hand wave at highly sensitive political and legal stipulations. It's obvious their only interest is in the Bible, not actual archaeology. And when this interest in the Bible is prioritized, then it becomes easy, justifiable to employ any means to this end. The only thing that matters to these people is that the Bible is right. But in so doing, they are also enabling a lot of highly controversial, wide-ranging ideology. What does it mean for Palestine and Israel if Stripling has shown the presence of Hebrew language and culture in the Bronze Age at a site that currently belonged to Palestine? You can be sure that this is just the sort of discovery that ultra-nationalist Zionist political groups will latch onto in their efforts to further dispossess Palestinian people. We, we, what we did was we got a, an export permit. So I wanted to take the tablet to Prague because the lab in Prague had expertise and a track record mm. of scanning through lead. So the uh, Antiquities Authority signed an export uh, permit allowing it to be taken to Prague. And uh, so when I showed that to the to the editor, there's nothing more that okay. reviewer two could say. Somebody had told him something and he believed some bad information. Importantly, I think Stripling is talking about an export license needed to get the object out of Israel and to Prague for testing. But the issues of legality run much deeper than this. The Mount Ebal dump salvage project appears to not have been a legally sanctioned activity. When this story originally came out last year, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported that, quote, such a license, as far as is known, was not issued, end quote. Um, but yeah, it's mm -hmm. complex. We're, Sean, we're okay. in the West Bank, Judea, Samaria. Uh, and since 1993, yeah. um, Judea, Samaria has been carved up between areas A, B, and C. This is an area B, so it's the most sensitive area of the most sensitive part mm. of the world. Outside of that, it was not a problem at all. Okay? Yeah. As for ownership, in another interview on the 12th of May, Stripling said that the object is currently in storage at the IAA and that it should be displayed at the Spectacular National Museum in Jerusalem. However, since the site from where it was taken is in Area B in the West Bank, which is under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority, then one would think it actually belongs to Palestine, not Israel. My fear is that people in the pew will actually hear these claims and they're going to desperately want them to be true. Hmm. And so they're going to latch on to them because they want it to be true. And they even believe it to be true. And it's not true. And then I feel badly that they've basically been misled. Don't wish for something so badly to be true that you're willing to consider hmm. it true, even if it doesn't follow from the evidence, right? Hmm. Uh, so just, just demand 
demand the facts. Hit subscribe because archaeology is a topic we talk about now and then, new finds, old finds. So if you want biblical archaeology, uh, make sure you subscribe. And if you thought about studying apologetics, we'd love to have you at Biola. We actually have an adjunct professor, a friend of yours, Scott Titus Kennedy, who teaches a course for us now and then. I've also had a few videos covering the work of Dr. Kennedy. And I don't think I could recommend any course from either of these Scots, but I definitely can recommend Kip's new 18 lecture course. Real Israelite Religions, Facts on the Ground, and Propaganda in the Bible. So the special challenge that we will grapple with in this course is against this strange background and delving deeply into this very unusual world for most of us. An accurate picture of Israelite religion is not necessarily gleaned from what we read directly in the Old Testament. What is in the Hebrew Bible is frequently at odds with or in contradiction to what appears in the archaeological record. And so our approach to Israelite religion needs to carefully weigh these differences. These people are reflecting back on the story of Yahweh's deliverance of the Hebrews from Pharaoh and also on their own covenantal obligation to him. They are the people of Israel, not because of heredity, but because they have kept the commandments of God. We see through this that all Israel, then, is a cultural ideal, grounded not just in the memory of the Exodus, but also in the covenant of Yahweh. This is part of why I have titled the, the whole course the way I have. We need to get into the mindset of understanding what the Hebrew Bible is. It is a form of royal propaganda, and it is in contradistinction to the archaeological record of religion in ancient Israel. As with all the MVP courses, it's beautifully shot, well-paced, and visually engaging for a learning experience beyond what you get in a university setting where Dr. Davis would normally be teaching. You can sign up today at tinyurl.com slash kipreligion. And if you use that link, you'll be financially benefiting the Apologia channel and its mission, which I greatly appreciate. Again, tinyurl.com slash kipreligion. Or check the link in the video description. Scott, appreciate you a ton. Uh, keep up the good work and let's do it again. I'm not so sure it's good work. So rather than do that again, how about you tap on the link on screen now for more Apologia collaborations with Dr. Kip Davis, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later.